So did television come to you or did you go to television? Television came to me. I was really not into television. I'd been asked to do a number of things. I'd done some pilot work and stuff over the year and it was all very formulaic and kind of lame and I didn't really like the people I was dealing with. Mm -hmm. And then um, my agent got me a job. <laughs> How often does that happen that your agent mm -hmm. actually gets you a job? Mm -hmm. uh, when he was in Banff and he met one of the producers on Queer as Folk and he talked them up to me and they went, oh yeah, we know this guy. And they, were, they had had two seasons they had done and they weren't really happy with the writer's room they had. So they put a whole no, new room basically together for the third season with the exception of Michael McLennan, who is also a playwright. Um, you might know him. Mm -hmm. uh, and they brought me, me in and another Canadian writer and it all kind of came together and it was like the, the show which had been struggling to find what its format was, you know, in the first season they were kind of like, we solve everything in one hour, you know, uh, Emmett becomes an alcoholic and by the end of the hour he has to not be an alcoholic anymore, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And then it got a little more serialized in the second season, but when we started the third season it was very much like, okay, this is serialized drama. Some people would call it soap opera, we're going to call it serialized drama. And we found... Um, I think the right mix of personalities mm -hmm. uh, with three Canadians and three Americans, uh, all of us queer, but all of us from very, very different backgrounds, it really started to cook. And so, you know, we were allowed to talk about the only, the only notes we got from the network was, could you put more lesbian sex in, please? Like literally everything else they, they were fine with. And we could talk about and do whatever we wanted to. And we dealt with substance addiction and we dealt with barebacking and we dealt with uh, uh, violence against gays and gays promoting violence. We dealt, we dealt with all kinds of subjects that we never had to once consider the straight audience for. And mm -hmm. that was an amazing freedom. But also too, it's a, it was a show that broke out into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. it, was, it wasn't just for a gay audience. It was something that, did you finally But it was entirely that? a gay world. That Absolutely. Was, that was their whole reason when they started the show and they mm -hmm. never let go of that is that there are lots of shows for straight people out mm -hmm. there. We don't have to put them in our show. Mm -hmm. It is an entire straight show and I think that the reason we had such a big straight audience was first of all, the women loved it. Right. Straight women loved the show and they also loved the sex between the two men. That same thing that they say about straight guys and two women is absolutely true of straight women and two men. They love the sex and then their boyfriends and husbands would have to watch it with them because they got the sex afterwards, right? Because right. yeah. everyone got all turned on. So how they, you know, how you justify that is none of my business. But in terms of um, being able to write some really groundbreaking, challenging television within the parameters of cable, it was an amazing experience. And finally you felt like you were, you must have felt vindicated that you were just reaching a larger audience and that you didn't have to compromise necessarily. Oh yeah, no, it was, it was amazing that mm -hmm. way. I mean, it was amazing. And, and people, people would say they knew my scripts before the, even the credit at the end, that they could tell which right. ones I had written. Mm -hmm. But um, we were a really tight group. And you know, when you talk about writer's rooms or, or um, uh, writers groupings and things like that. I mean, it was really the most positive of that kind of experience. It was not to say that we didn't disagree and we didn't fight like cats and dogs and yell at each other and stuff from time to time, but we always did it knowing we had this larger thing in mind to do, and it was to talk about the world we lived in in an honest way. Do you remember anything, any fight that stands out in your head? Like anything that's like, oh, I remember that one day. It was like, oh. Well, we always, you know, the Canadians always wanted to play up the lesbian couple more and we always wanted to bring in a more diverse cast. Mm -hmm. We always wanted to be, it to be a little more colorful, mm -hmm. people of different shapes and sizes and that kind of thing. And the Americans were very not into that, that they knew who their audience was and what they would accept. And they never acknowledged their own prejudices, but it was very much that. And you're living in a racist, very divided country to begin with. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there was, there was friction over that kind of thing mm -hmm. um, that could get quite, quite heated at times. What are some of the differences uh, between uh, theatre and TV writing, like a TV script? Well, it's interesting because, you know, TV has changed so much since this new century has started and, you know, things like Queer as Folk and things like Breaking Bad and things like Game of Thrones have really reinvented what TV is and for me, TV now is kind of that perfect medium between film and theater. Mm -hmm. You know, theater tends to be blah, 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 and film tends to be all pictorial, and TV falls somewhere in the middle where you can have the blah, 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 and you can have the pictorial going on, and you can do some really interesting long-term storytelling where you can think of stories in terms of 10 hours rather mm -hmm. than two hours, which is a really exciting thing for me. And this world also opened up a lot of opportunities for you, like, uh, 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 
directing, like, mm -hmm. you know, and to, so what, how did the, did, did you go into this experience going, oh yeah, now this is my in, I'm going to take this advantage of this and I'm going to ask if I can get opportunities to well, direct? Well, yes and no. I mean, I had directed uh, the movie version of Poor Superman Leaving Metropolis prior to that. In fact, just the summer before I was oh, okay. hired. So that was already, um, that was already in place, and that was, a, you know, that was a very frustrating experience because we didn't have any money. I mean, right. literally, we, were, we had eight-hour days, and I was doing one take with the actors and then carrying on. So, you know, my frustration with the movie is the same as, I think, a lot of other people's when they're watching it, which is just nothing is being realized mm -hmm. the way it needs to be in a movie. But, you know, I, I'm not afraid of failure. Like, I, I, you know, I don't think every project is going to succeed. I, I know that I'm going to learn and I know if it's my first TV script or my first film I direct or whatever, it's not going to be as good as what I will eventually become. Unfortunately with film, I've never been given another opportunity to do anything and it's a bit uh, demoralizing because there are people who've turned out much worse first features than me, who've gone on to make a lot of other movies, some of them not much better than their first feature. So why I was so decisively pushed out of that world and not allowed back in in Canada, and that's definitely what happened. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure. I think it's a case of people's expectation because of what I'd done in the theatre being so high mm -hmm. that their disappointment with the movie they saw really had a, a, a profound effect on them. What about your writing influenced your directing uh, and vice versa? I try not to let them uh, inform one another too much. I, I see them as different processes. I don't want to be directing something on paper when I'm writing it because I know I'm not going to be the only person directing it. Mm -hmm. And also, when I do direct my own work and I go to, uh, I, I treat it just like anybody else's play and I have to rediscover it and it becomes a whole, an entirely different thing. And I find a lot of things I never even considered when I was writing it, when I'm directing it. So, you know, the, they're, they're intertwined in my mind and in my heart, but in my process, I try to keep them as far away from each other as I can. And when I'm directing a play, particularly, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, the playwright is dead. Mm -hmm. We're not right. talking to him, he's not here, he's not in the room, we are going to make what he's written work as good as we can, and if we can't make it work, then I will go and talk to the playwright with my special in I have with him when we're not working, but mm. he's not going to come into this process with us right now. Do you write every now and again, because uh, uh, sometimes a, a director who writes will uh, uh, have a, a very specific uh, a script description because they know exactly how they're going to direct it. Right. Do you ever, uh, now that you've directed, do you ever write a scene going, oh, okay, I know exactly how I'm going to direct this and I'm just going to... No, because when I'm writing it, I'm only writing it. I'm mm. not directing it. I'm very much being the writer and I don't want to, I don't want to have directorial considerations because they're not the writer's considerations. I will put all, I will pose all kinds of questions and problems in the mm. writing that the director and the designers have to solve. That's not my job to solve it. So if I'm mm. thinking about solving it while I'm on the page, I may in some way be censoring myself. So mm. I try never, never to do that.